the kit that Dr. Angle will be using is the Sage Fitsification DMSO based kits. Um, it was recently modified and now come in a new packaging with uh, cryo vials. Uh, it has the indication for all stages, oocytes through blastocysts. It comes with protocols for both uh, drops, but also 1 ml uh, volumes. And it comes with a 7 day uh, open bottle uh, stability. The carrier that we'll be using today is the Vitigard. It's our closed system vitrification carrier. It's available in eight different colors, as you can see on the screen. And it comes in packages of 20 individually packed carriers or in larger boxes of 50 uh, in packs of five. The main feature of the Vitrigard is its unique uh, shape that will allow more uh, space saving uh, storage, up to 50% uh, increase in storage efficiency compared to uh, popular competitor products. But for now, I'll just hand over the mic to uh, Dr. Marlene. She has, uh, currently works as a um, uh, laboratory uh, director, uh, consultant in a number of American uh, centers. And she has over the years trained many of the skilled uh, embryologists performing vitrification in, uh, in the US. So uh, I look forward to the tips and tricks. Thanks. Right, I think I'm on. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is we have no liquid nitrogen, so we're not going to actually uh, dunk and freeze today, uh, but we're going to still walk through the, the process of doing it, and I'll talk about some of the things that I think are unique and important to doing vitrification. The first thing is, is when any person gets and starts vitrification, you have to make a decision about how long your embryos are going to sit in that first ES solution. So vitrification, the process of freezing is two steps, five to 15 minutes in the equilibration solution, and then a minute in the vitrification solution, then you load onto the device. So the first question is, do you really want to leave it 5 to 15 minutes? Maybe you want to make a specific decision about how long you want your embryos or oocytes to sit in that solution. And a lot of it will depend on what you're freezing or what you're vitrifying. For us, when we started making decisions about what are we going to do with blastocysts, the first thing we did was we sat down and measured the response of our blastocysts when we put them in the equilibration solution. So we put them on our big inverted scope and then we measured how quickly they shrank and how quickly they re-expanded. So we knew where they started. We wanted to get them back to that point at the end. So we said, how long does it take for an embryo to do that? So we found it ran about six and a half to seven and a half to eight minutes. So we decided in our lab doing blastocysts that we were going to leave them in there for eight minutes. We didn't want to leave them for 15 because we didn't see any reason to leave them longer than we knew that they had already equilibrated. So we went with eight minutes and that's worked well for us. So we would put, and I've already set up the dishes here, we've put 300 microliters of equilibration solution and 300 microliters of the vitrification solution. So for any of you who have done vitrification, it's pretty straightforward. So we've got the blue beads here. One of the other things that I think is really key is that you not have your focus so tight that all you can see is your embryo. You can't see where it is in the dish. You want to be far enough back to be able to actually visualize your embryo, pick it up easily, know where it is in your stripper tip and where it goes into the next drop. So you don't want to be tight, tight, tight. You want to be back a bit. So at this point, I'm just picking up a blue bead. Now, the, obviously, the thing our beads are not going to do is the beads aren't going to float. And so everyone who's ever done vitrification knows the first thing you have to wrestle with is the fact that your embryo floats and you have to be able to follow it, which is why I say don't have a tight focus 
You want to be relatively far back. So when you put that embryo into the dish, you can watch it float and you can watch it settle back down. So you keep an eye on your, your embryo. Because until you really learn how to do this, it's amazing how transparent they get when they first go into that equilibration solution. So don't have a tight, dark focus. So like I said, are you okay? Okay. It's um, So it's right here. All right, is it showing up on there? Yeah, so again, I'm not tight and I'm not close. It's just all you have to do is have a visualization of this. When you're first doing those studies, if you want to watch the shrinkage and re-expansion of the blastocyst, obviously you have to be tight enough to measure it. So we would put it on an inverted scope. We'd get out our measuring tool and we actually, we took measurements across two both vertical and horizontal. Um, but once you have that figured out, then you want to be relatively far back. So it's faint. It's faint on my scope. Sorry if it's not showing up on there. But it's in. OK, you can see it. You can see it. Great. All right, so we put it in. You don't have to spend any time um, here. We're not going to go the whole eight minutes. But then at the end of eight minutes, you'd pick it up and move it. So there's the bead. It's on the bottom. I had to go find it a bit, you know, because these, the, actually, this solution is so thick and so viscous, the bead even floated. So, you know, you see you have the same problem when you're working with your embryos. They're going to go float around on you. So you have to watch them, follow them, see what, they, see what they do. You'll see that in the vitrification solution, they'll shrink up very, very tightly, they be, which means they become a little more visible to you. But they're not going to, the beads aren't going to do that. So then the next issue is let's get them onto the device. So if any of you have used a cryolock device, the VitraGuard is very, very similar to the cryolock, which I love. We have used the cryolock for many years. One of the things we did with it is we put embryos on and we threw this device around our room around the lab. We, we knocked it on the bench, we threw it against the wall, we dropped it on the floor to see if we could di dislodge the embryos. And we could not do it. So the embryos stay on the device. Same thing is going to happen with a VitraGuard, which is nice for me because we ship embryos around the US a lot. That's very common. And we've gotten a number of devices that have come in either broken or the embryos aren't on there, we can't find them. And I believe that the person who's sending them to us sent us embryos. But when you get a broken device, when you get devices that come in with the caps that have been dislodged, if you find devices that are sort of curled up in the bottom of your, your goblet, to me that says there was a problem potentially in shipping. We had one time where embryos were shipped four blocks in San Francisco, from one program four blocks away from us to us. And by the time they got there, every single device, they, who shall remain nameless, it wasn't a, it wasn't a vitro guard, but they were all out of their goblets and all the caps had come off the devices in four blocks. So I don't know what the shipper was doing. Maybe they rolled it down the hill for four blocks. I don't know. Oh, FedEx, they don't care. No matter what you write on your shipping container, you can say this side up, you can say please do not turn over, you can say medical specimens handle with care, they don't care. And they'll tell you that if you call and complain. They say they're going to put that shipper into their shipping 
uh, into their truck in any way they want that works for them. Uh, yeah, yeah. And they'll drop it on you too. And that must have been what they did to have this thing. So we have broken devices, things out of the goblets, no caps on anything in four blocks. So imagine what's happening if you ship your samples across the country. So <laughs> I wanted to make sure that I had a device. Oh, sorry, that gets really loud there, doesn't it? I wanted to make sure I had a device that was as FedEx resistant as I could make it. So we tried to dislodge our samples. You know, I can't do anything if they're going to throw the thing around, but I can at least make sure that the embryos stick to the devices, and they do. They stick well on the VitroGuard, and they stick well on the CryoLock. They do not stick well on CryoTops or CryoTex. I like the devices if I'm staying, if they're staying in-house, but if they have to travel, I want something those embryos are going to stick to like glue. And, pardon? Rapid eye. You know, those are good. Yeah, because they're, they're in that little hole. They're not going anywhere. The rapid eye is closest to... It's a closed system. Yeah, right. Right, and that's good. I think VitroGuard and CryoLock have gotten FDA clearance because they're a semi-closed. I mean, you're going to put a cap on this. So I think they're good too. All right, so the next question is, how much fluid do you put on your device? Do you put a big droplet or do you put a little tiny droplet? Do you suck the fluid off once you put it down? So I think sort of historically people have said you want to put the embryo on the, the device and suck your fluid out. I don't like that because I don't like how you go to have to, what you have to do to get the embryo off of the device. So if you've sucked all the fluid up, it flattens out your embryo and it sticks really well and sometimes too well. So the goal is to keep it on the device, but you also have to get it off the device. So rather than trying to go and scrape it up, which is often what you have to do, if it's flattened out and it's completely adhered to that cryolock or to your, your VitroGuard, you have to sort of go in and scrape. I don't want to have to do that. So one of the tricks that we use is I'm going to pull it up just past the end, and I'm just going to sort of tap, tap it down onto there. So when you look at these devices, the nice thing about the, about the VitroGuard is you can lay it flat on your surface. So I usually use a great big dish. We don't have those here today, but I just set it right down. The tip is not going to touch the surface of your, your heating plate. You want to put it, I'm going to want to put it on the device right above the black part here. You don't want to put it on the black part. And if you look for the Origio name on the device, that's in the same plane as the curve of the VitroGuard. So that's what I'm going to shoot for. So I'm just going to pull, just pull it up into the tip. I'm going to set it so I can see it and so it's got the curve up. And then I'm going to come down and I'm not really expelling much. There it is, it came right out. That's, that drop is a little big because I had touched it with my pipette tip. So that's a little bigger than I would normally use. But if it hadn't come out immediately, I would have touched it again and then touched it again and touched it again, just sort of working my way up the tip away from the black end. And capillary action is going to pop it right out of there. So you don't have to expel. You don't have to do much to it at all. It's just going to pretty much come out on its own. And then it's usually, if you're just tapping your way up the device, you don't have to really go in and pull up solution off of that. Now, if I had done this because I already touched it, there was already a little bit of fluid on there, with a drop this big, I would go in and pull a little bit off of that because that's a big drop. The problem with the big drops, it's a different problem than with those really small drops. If you have a big drop, 
the problem is that the minute you slide that device into your, to your first thaw solution, it's going to pop off like that. And that's, that's great, but if you're doing O sites, that's not so good because you want to be able to follow those guys closely around in your dish. With embryos, you can find them a little more easily, but with O sites, you know, if you've vitrified O sites, they get transparent. You, can't, you have a hard time finding them. So I, I'm fine with a drop that size for embryos. With an O site, I want it a little smaller. So then when we put, you're going to put it in, you would put it in without a cap. Now, this has got the curve side up. I want to put it in curve side that way, and I'm going to push it through my vitrification solution. So I put it in and push it back and around. I've seen people put it in and go, <laughs> that's, I think, a little aggressive. <laughs> I don't think you need to do that to accomplish the job. All you really need to do is stick it in. You want to move, you want to get it cold fast, so you don't want to just let it sit there because it's going to have that little vapor bubble around it. So you want to move it around, but don't shake the hell out of it. <laughs> you know, be nice to it. So you put it in, you shake it, and then you can, you can take the, the cover. And while it's still under, under liquid nitrogen, slide your cover over. So obviously the thing, the primary rule is once it goes into the liquid nitrogen, you never, 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 never take it out, right? Okay, so now let's talk a little bit, let's talk a little bit about warming. Um, so the, the kits, what we do is we take out the first solution. So let's say we know we're going to warm two devices two embryos, we usually, we do, well, it depends on my lab. Sometimes we'll put maybe two embryos on a device if we haven't done PGTA on them. But in many of my labs, we're doing 100% PGTA these days or days are pretty close to it. So we're pretty routinely doing one uh, embryo per device. So we put one tube in the incubator per device that we're going to thaw per patient. So in other words, if we have two patients to thaw and we're going to do one embryo per patient, I have one lab that transfers 1.09 embryos per patient. So we're pretty darn close to single embryo transfers. So it would be one tube per, per patient. We put them in, we have a non-CO2 incubator, we put them in there the night before. So we let it get really nice and warm overnight and initially what we did is we set up one incubator that's just for vitrification and we will measure the temperature in a vial to make sure we want that temperature between 37.0 and 38.0. The temperature in the fluid in the vial. I don't care what the temperature of the incubator is. I only care what my embryos are seeing. So we'll put the dishes and we'll put the vials into the incubator overnight. If I had a CO2 incubator, I would probably not do that because I can't guarantee to you that these are gas impermeable through the lid. So then you would want them in. The nice thing about these smaller vials rather than the big tubes is that, you know, we're going to use this whole vial. So the first thing to do is when you're ready to warm, don't take the vial out and do this to it. If you want to do this to it, do it before you put it in the incubator. So anything you do to this is going to adjust the temperature. So what you want to be able to do is go grab this vial, bring it out, pour it. Don't pipette it. You don't need to pipette it. So you're going to come out, you're going to pour it into your first dish. So that thaw, this is the thaw solution. You're going to pour it into um, your, first, your first dish. So this is, sorry, I can't do all this with one hand. This is a little nifty device. Okay, this is a little nifty device that Cooper has that you can put in your incubator and it's warm and so it will sort of give you um, a heat sink or a, a heat, it's, it's a heater sort of, passive heat. So what we do is we just pull this out right before, the last thing we're gonna do, we get all our paperwork ready, we would have our device in the, the, the liquid nitrogen, have our tubes on or our tips on, get everything ready. The last thing we do is go to the incubator, grab out this device, pour it in there, bring it over here, and, and plunge. So I usually keep, I set up exactly like this. 
when I'm doing, except mine, my second bench here is a, instead of a stool, it's my trash can. <laughs> so I put this on my trash can, and it's, I set it right beside me. You know, you don't want to walk from the other side of the room to the, to the uh, bench top here, and you don't necessarily want it right beside your, your, um, your stage because it will, you can sit there and watch it, it's going to off-gas and drop down onto you. So I think the things, I know I've gotten the high sign, I'm running out of time, but the, the important things are get from here into here quickly, bring it out the very last thing, so you want that temperature to stay between 37 and 38. Everything you do, if you pipette it, it's going to cool it down. If you flip this back and forth, it's going to cool it down. So I think it's not so much with blast assist that that temperature is so critical, but I think with eggs, it really is. So it's the small things, you know, hopefully you figured something out here that you might be doing different that can help. This is a, a great thing to come into because it's going to keep your dish warm. Um, Do and don't pipette. Absolutely. I always check my temperature so with a thermal couple. But, well, see, what I do is I put a separate water uh, tube into the incubator. So then, and that's, that. and that's what I check. So you're right. It would be non-sterile, and I would not stick it into this. But I would have it in a tube, a separate tube that I measure. Because you never know when somebody's going to come along and mess with your, your temperature setting. 37 to 38. Yeah. Yes, because by the time you pl you plunge that device, that's a cold device. By the time you plunge that plunge that device into there, it's going to cool it down a little. So if you start at 38, you're going to be down to 37. Leave it one minute, and then it's just a matter of pull it up and put it into the. Follow, you know, any embryologist can pick it up from that point and just follow it through. Because the hard part is finding it because it gets tran transparent. The hard part is making sure you've got your temperature right. Um, once you've got those mastered, then you just walk through the, the steps. Three minutes in the second solution and two drops of 300 microliters each for the two final, final equilibrations. Do you um, touch the eggs when they are in this uh, TS? Do I touch the eggs? Yes, I will move eggs around in the, the TS. I want to make sure I know I have it and I'm ready to go. Because when that minute ends, you want to, do I make a circle? No, did you touch them actually or you just kind of circle around them? Oh, when no, I'll pick them up and move them around in the TS. In the TS. If they're eggs. And then once I put them into the second solution, the first, you know, the warming solution, then I do that sort of pillow technique where you pull up about three millimeters on your stripper, pull up your oocyte, put it in and expel so you have a little cushion of the more concentrated and it kind of gives you that diffusion coefficient or gradient. Not with, I don't worry so much about that with embryos, but I do with oocytes, yeah.